So we start, um, everyone, a series today called Teach Me to Pray. Uh, we'll do it five weeks because I believe that there were five segments, five um, kind of a model that Jesus gave his disciples to pray when they came and asked us, hey, teach us to pray. And we'll look through those five kind of. Really, he breaks it down into three, I believe, very easy ways when a disciple goes to Jesus and closes the door and prays to the Father in heaven, um, which is, you know, he's going to say, you know, I want you to start with God. I want you to, when you do that, I want you to tell him how great he is. I want you to yield your will to his will. Then I want you to tell him what you need. And there are two, th there are three things specifically what you need within that third one, you know, which is I just have needs and concerns that concern me, and then I need to, I have needs about my relationships that I'm in, um, and then I need help with temptation. That's why he says that. So really, three simple ways, and then the last thing, even Jesus says, I'm going to tell you what you really need. <laughs> you do need those daily things that concern you that are big on your heart, and then you really need to make sure your relationships are fixed and forgiven and healing and at least on the pathway to healing, and then you need to pray that you'll not succumb to temptation because it's always there. Or am I the only one who feels tempted at times, okay? And so we'll look at that model. We'll take the first one here this morning. Um, and um, let's read it. I'll put it on the screen here for you. Let's just read the disciples coming to Jesus and asking how to pray. He said, now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And that's what rabbis tended to do. They gave their disciples models for prayer. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who's indebted to us, and then lead us not into temptation. Okay? Now, this may draw to mind Matthew, and it's a little bit more of an extended prayer. And um, there, Jesus made it part of a sermon on the mount. And here, as a teacher, you know, um, it looks like one of his disciples who may either not have yet joined the group or maybe had just wanted a reminder. And good teachers don't just say something once and then never say it again, right? So if you accuse me of redundancy, well, that's what teachers do, <laughs> right? So Jesus would have, it's not like there's two conflicting accounts, right? Oh, the Bible is not accurate. It's too, too. Well, Jesus would have said things more than once. And not every teacher says things all the time the same way. He meets, makes a much more abbreviated because he's trying to give a model, okay, a model of prayer here. And, um, you know, it's interesting when we talk about prayer too, because I think what Jesus is getting here is there's a mindset that you need for prayer that I want you to have, and then once you get a mindset for prayer, then there's a way to pray that can change you. Because in one sense, we have this little tension uh, in Scripture that Jesus says actually in Matthew, he warns them about vain babbling, repeated phrases over and over again. And then he says, don't do that. Other, you know, pagans do that with their bump, babbling, 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 hoping the gods will hear them for their many phrases. Or you get caught in what I just call perfunctory praying. Perfunctory praying is what I did growing up. Bless those behind the iron curtain and the bamboo curtain. That was kind of a prayer that Christians said back then. I heard my cousin say that once and I thought, brilliant. Here I am praying for missionaries by name. I was taught to do that as a kid. I could just sum it up into, and be with those behind the Iron Curtain, which is those Christians in Russia, right? Be with those behind the Bamboo Curtain. That was kind of my prayer. So it's like, oh, perfect. I'm all for efficiency, if you know me. I don't know. It's just like, <laughs> right. But we get caught into that. We're not thinking what we're saying. So I don't think the Lord's Prayer was meant to just be, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I can't even come. Oh, we're so sad we took that out of the schools. Well, in a sense, we are, right? But in one sense, hey, it, was a, it was a model for prayer, okay? Um, I grew up around the dinner table, my, you know, the prayer that we said every meal, and we meant it, but still, it was perfunctory. It was, dear Jesus, thank you for this food, bless it to our bodies, in Jesus' name, amen. And you just said it without thinking. I remember one time having devotions, we'd have devotions for a good period of time. As a family afterwards, my, my dad would read the Bible, and then we'd, we'd pray. We usually get on our knees and pray, but my parents were both first-generation Christians, so, I mean, they were radically into it, okay? I mean, so, um, which is good, right? We want radical Christians. And, but I can still remember it was so perfunctory several times bowing. Okay, Stephen, you start our time of prayer. We're supposed to be praying, you know, for our family and general things. And I'd get down on my knees and say, dear Jesus, uh, thank you for this food and bless the bodies. And I, I'd stop way through and I'd go, oh, shoot. See, there's my mind getting into perfunctory praying. <laughs> okay. So I don't think it's that. It's not a model of rote that I just have to say this prayer and therefore I prayed. Jesus is giving a model. 
I think it's more of a mindset for prayer because Jesus says, don't be like those people who just say many words, pile up phrases, find like literally cool Christian phrases to pray. They think they will be heard because of their clever phrases, their beautiful phrases. Don't do that. Don't be like them. Your heavenly Father, what? Knows what you need before you even ask Him. Whoa. Whoa. Didn't David say that too in the Old Testament? He said, before a word is on my tongue, you what? You know it completely, O Lord. You already know what I'm going to say before I say it. Well, then why pray? God already knows what I'm going to say. He knows what I need before I ask. God's not surprised like, oh, oh, that was a good prayer. Yeah, it was good. I'm going to answer that. I never thought, I never thought of that. Yeah, why don't I bless your, why don't I, why don't I fix your husband, you know? Why have I been so slow? You just haven't asked it in that way. That was so beautiful and so hard. And, oh, you're so desperate now. Now I'll fix your husband because you're desperate. I'm picking on you guys, right? Okay. <clears throat> so I don't think it's that. I don't think, you know, we're going to wrench the thing. I don't think it's the clever phrases. I think ultimately Jesus says, listen, prayer is probably more than just asking for things and having God answer. He already knows. Prayer just might be a way, it's a fundamental thing that grows my relationship with God, and that's what God wants. And if God's discipling us, changing us, prayer is meant to change me. So I think Jesus, in one sense, could say to us, if you want to keep changing as a Christian, changing your mindset, changing the way you feel, most of our prayers are based out of the way we currently feel. Would you say that? That's why it's, we want to start with us. We're going to see when Jesus says here, he's going to say, you're going to want to start with you. I don't want you to start with you. I want you to start with God. I want you to start with me. But we do that because there is a certain way we're feeling. And we all want to feel different, right? How many hate feeling certain ways at certain times, okay? Maybe you're like, you know, I, I feel that way. I'm just like, how do I feel this way again? Like, am I depressed? Am I, am I battling depression? Have I been battling depression for 10 years and haven't even known it? <laughs> you're all looking maybe really concerned. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I know how I feel. <laughs> okay? So we all want to feel a certain way. We want to change a certain way. I think Jesus is saying, listen, I want to help you disciples. And I want to teach you how to pray. So... You know, this is what Jesus basically says here. He says, the disciples came. They asked him to talk to pray. Surprisingly, this is found in your intro and your outline if you want to take it out. Surprisingly, Jesus didn't say, it doesn't matter how you pray. He could have said that, right? Oh, no, no, no. Prayer is just talking to God. It doesn't matter how you pray. You can pray any way you want. He, he actually took them up on the offer, which means it, this is going to shock some long-term Christians, right? It does matter how you pray. Oh, that's very offensive. I can pray anytime I want on I-65, putting on my makeup, talking on the phone, and I can also be whispering prayers. I would say yes, because Jesus also said, hey, I want you to pray without ceasing. So I think there is time where you can shut up a prayer with God. You should be in constant communication with him. Oh, Lord, help me with this difficult person. Help me. Lord, help me, my attitude with this. It's fine. But I think Jesus did say, listen, if you're my disciple, I want you to go into your room. I want you to close the door. And then I want you to pray to your father who's in secret. And then he gave him this model for prayer. And I think it's okay if you're walking and praying or maybe driving and praying to train yourself as a disciple to pray this way, okay? And so let's go through it in that way. So he took them off on the offer and he set before them a, a prayer that would guide them as they pray. And here's the model that God gave them. So Jesus taught us that when we are to pray, here's the mindset first, because he says your overall mindset should be this when you begin to go to God in prayer. First of all, note, Always start with God. He basically tells them, start with God, right? Our Father, hallowed be your name. Nothing about me in there yet, right? So start with God. This is difficult, okay? It's so hard to just pause. Don't rush to the things that are on my mind, my anxieties, my fears, my frustrations, my need for this, my need for that, what I'm, you know. And he says, just pause for a moment. And the cool thing about the prayer is you get to get to that. God knows that there's stuff on your heart that you need to pour out before the Father, cry it out, yell it out, stomp your feet out. I don't know what you do when you're praying, right? God knows that, but he says, when you, if you're my disciple, I'm going to teach you how to pray. And the cool thing is, let me just say this, why he's teaching them to pray, because the disciples are very curious. They probably watched Jesus, and they thought, there's something different about this guy. Fundamentally different the way he talks to God when we hear him pray out loud, maybe when we overhear his prayers. Fundamental, like, we want that type of relationship. So they're basically saying, how do we get what you got? And Jesus is basically saying, I'm going to show you how to get what I got. 
And what he first of all he says is, hit pause and start with God. Okay? Um, and that's really difficult, right? Because we naturally don't want to start with God. We want to start with us because we have a lot that's piling up. Okay? So basically, you know, I heard one preacher say this. We just want to do a quick, a quick um, Father, you know, thank you for this day. And now here's the things I need. Like Lucy and Peanuts when she's given the list to Santa Claus, right? Please note the size and color of each item. I need this for this person, this for that. I need you to do this. I need you to help me in this. Please, get, you know, please make this person go away. Please help my house to sell. Please help me to get a raise. Please change my husband. Please change my wife. Please change my husband. Please change my wife. This might be m- most of the common prayers God's always hearing, right? But God says set aside the anxiety, right, the concerns, the depression, the frustration, and your needs, and just get intense and start focusing on God, Okay? And I will say, I've talked to people, we've, we've preached on this before, Do you remember, remember, this is nothing new to this congregation, I'm just revisiting it a couple years later, I remember talking to one uh, girl in my small group, said, it, it, this is really difficult, this is so difficult for me to pray, because I, it, it did not feel natural to me. I started to try and do this, you know, to kind of start with God and not with me, and it didn't feel natural. And then she did say, after a while it got easier, a little bit easier and easier until it was natural. And that's like anything, and again, I'm just saying to all of us as disciples of Jesus, even if you're not a disciple, I guarantee you, this will help your mindset at least about God. Jesus would say, if you're my disciple, I want you always to start with God, okay? And train yourself to do this because it's just fundamental to prayer to start with God, even if it doesn't feel natural. The human condition, listen, we are so inundated, we are so wrapped up in ourselves, good or bad in the moment, right? That it is so difficult to get our eyes off ourselves and onto something bigger and better than ourselves. Obviously, God knows when you start in prayer, you need to get your eyes off yourself for even a minute. And as one theologian said, blessed riddance once you start doing it for a while, right? It's like, I'm sick of thinking about myself and my problems. I need to focus on something else, okay? Listen, there is a discipline in every field, every trade, every business, and every science, and it's fundamental that you don't violate these things if you're going to have success. Whether you're a doctor, whether you're a sales guy, whether you're a trainer, there are fundamentals you don't move off of. There's freedom within there to put your own personality. All of our prayers that start with God don't have to sound the same. I hope that they wouldn't. But there are just fundamentals that you have to do and master. I was talking about this with Jason with volleyball in the first service. I mean, there are some girls involved, but there's fundamental ways, right, to set, to pass, to bump, to where you have your feet, where you have your hands, and someone can't say, well, I'm just going to be me. Well, you can be me on the bench, because I need to master the fundamentals, and then you can have your own style within that, but there's a certain way we set, you hold your fingers, the ball goes, there's some varieties in there, but you've got to master the fundamentals if you're going to grow. And it's a muscle, it's like an unused muscle, Okay. Every field, I guarantee you, that's why we educate ourselves, right? There's a certain way, and I have a friend, he's a writer. Have him help me actually edit some prayers. And it's, you know, just this fundamental grammar that you've got to do, and you can't just say, well, it's just me. It's my, you know, here's my, here's my book ready for publishing, and someone looks at it and goes, oh, my goodness, like you need major editing. No, 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 I just want it to be me. You're not going to sell anyone except to your mother. Your mother's going to be the only one who buys your book because you're violating fundamental principles, Okay grammar and dict- all those things. Jesus would say the same thing here to us. Just get these fundamentals down and then let your prayers come from your heart in these categories, okay? Even if it doesn't feel natural. Listen, I shared this before. Um, some of us in the church are also running for Team World Vision, which is kind of a cool thing. We're um, trying to raise money for um, clean drinking water around the world. So there's about 50, 60, 70 of us. And um, I signed up to do it, doing the mini marathon, or no, sorry, I'm doing uh, just a half marathon, doing the monumental. I shared with you that I wanted to do it. I was scared to do it because I would go out. I don't mind exercising. I like to exercise. I'd go out and try and run a mile or two or three. Within one of those, either mile one, two, or three, I'd start having slight knee pressure and then pain, and then I'd be almost hobbling, just could never continue. But I wanted to do this marathon, so I just thought, well, maybe I'm going to do everything I can to run it. So maybe there's something I don't know that I'm doing wrong, even though, hey, I'm just going out and running. And so I started to um, um, 
see some people in that profession. I saw a physical therapist. I saw some other people, and they started to say, your footfalls are not right. You're overstriding. you got to fix your posture. What we want you to start um, strengthening some of your, your gluteus maximus. We want you to, you know, the hip muscles. We want you to do lunges. All these things, get the right shoes. You need the right pace at first. You need, I wrote some of this down because, again, I'm going to tell you, it's become so natural for me good running form that I don't think about it. But when I first started, it felt so unnatural. It was like, you know, as I was running with my, I was like, well, I don't quite run like that, sorry. <laughs> I was like, who runs like this? This does not feel, I could just be, I just want to be me when I run. But I, I told you before, I had to work a process because I wanted a certain result at the end. So I worked a process, even though it felt unnatural, I disciplined myself to it because I wanted to do it. I didn't want to encourage some of our people. And not everyone can run it, right? Not everyone has it, whatever. We've all got our ministries. But I, I felt like if I'm championing this, I need to get out there and do it. So I told you. I did that. I focused just on the process, even though it felt unnatural. And I ran, I think I, last time I shared it, I ran three miles. A little bit of pressure there, but no pain. I was just like, hey, God, three miles. This Saturday, I ran six miles, not a quiver, not a pain, I mean, absolutely fantastic. I, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, this is what people who run feel like with no pain while they're running. Now, when it was all over, I'm just like, oh, limping around the house. No, not my knee, right, but just my body. But I'm just saying, I, you know, down to the fundamentals, and I got the end results. It didn't feel natural at first, but it felt natural now, where I had to write down, actually, for you, all the steps I had to take in order to get what I wanted. Okay? So my encouragement there is, Jesus says, listen, I know you'll want to start with you. And I guarantee you, if you're willing to do, pray like Jesus said, that we all should be praying. I'm not saying you can't shoot up occasional prayers to God here and there, right? But your fundamental prayer like Jesus says, I'm going to show you how to pray. It's not going to feel natural at first. But I want to tell you, if you'll just work the process, after a while, and I've had people who it will become more and more natural to just start with, well, we'll get into the, the, the meat of this now. It will be natural to start with God, okay? So, when you start with God, what do you say, okay? And, oh, and by the way, you know, six miles, and I probably am beating everyone here in pace and time. I mean, I don't think there's anyone who can beat me now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's not true at all. <laughs> but I'm so competitive, I've got to kind of trash talk, okay? So, when we start with God... Two parts here, okay? So our mindset is, when we go to prayer, okay, start with God, I don't start with me. When you start with God, he says, I want you to do two things. First of all, I want you to acknowledge him as Father, okay? Acknowledge him as Father. And he says, our Father, what's he saying? Start with the relationship. Some people are good at this. Um, I talked to a guy after the first service, he said, you know, I have been a Christian for 30 years, and I've always, I've disciplined myself, always start with God. Don't start with me, start with him, praise him, worship him, whatever. But I've never thought to start with the fundamental relationship. Listen, there's an order here, and I think Jesus meant it that we're to go in this order. We're not to get out of order, right? Because the order matters. Start with God, and when you start with God, first of all, before you tell him he's great, because that's the second part, right? You're going to acknowledge him as Father, and then tell him how great he is. Those are the first two parts when you start with God. But don't get the order wrong. He doesn't say tell him how great he is, and then remind yourself that he's your father. He says, first of all, when you come to God, and this is uniquely Christian, remind himself that you're part of a new relationship, that he is your spiritual daddy, okay? Start with God. Remind yourself of your fundamental relationship with Jesus Christ. He uses this term, Abba. It was a common word for dad, okay? It was familial. It was familiarity. Again, he doesn't say God the judge. Some of you struggle with that, don't you? God's the eternal judge in your mind, right? Condemning you, watching your performance, disappointed in you. He says, when you go to God, you go to him as father. You go to him as dad. You go to him as adopted child, adopted girl, adopted boy. He's not the judge. He's not the boss, okay? You've been adopted into a family. So start there. Sit down in your chair and say, Father, Dad, fundamental relationship with you. I'm so thankful that I'm your son, okay? 
that you love me, that you're close to me, that you're for me, you're never against me, you have my best interest in heart. Okay, you love me, you cover me, you fight for me, you have plans for me, you have dreams for me, you believe in me. Okay, you're like the Jewish mother. Ah, you know, son comes home. I got C's on my report card. My son the doctor, you know? (laughs) Ever believing that they're just going to move mountains, right? Here's what Paul says about our fundamental relationship with Jesus Christ if you've leaned your life into Jesus. He talks about adoption, okay? He says this in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, he chose us in him, it's me and you, before the creation of the world, God wanted you. Isn't that cool as a Christian? God wanted you before he laid the earth down. And he wanted you to be holy and blameless in his sight. Listen, no one here is, is behaviorally holy and blameless. But this is the theme I tell you guys again and again because of what grace has done, that you have a righteousness not your own, and God looks at you as holy and blameless, as unfathomable as that is. That's why he never gives up on you. Right? Remember we talked about that before? He's purified your hearts by grace, which means there's a spot on you that's absolutely pure, that's holy and blameless, and that's what God sees when he looks at you, and he goes... That is going to spread. I am not distracted by all this stuff. Okay? You're holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship, which was a common Roman word for a male heir who had been adopted and got the inheritance of the family. And it applies to both male and female now, right? Sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace. Okay? That's God giving us what we need which is unmerited, and you didn't earn it, and you don't have to try and earn it. He just gives it to you because you've come to him and wanted a relationship with him, okay? To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. What has he freely given us in the one he loves? Glorious grace. So that now you're a child, you're a son, you're a daughter. In him we have redemption through his blood. It's a reminder for us now. I have redemption through his blood, which means he's bought me back through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches, again, of His grace, okay? Your fundamental relationship. You are a spiritual child of God, okay? He is daddy. Isn't that wonderful? Okay? Listen, we have imperfect dads. I love my kids. I'm so imperfect. I don't perfectly love them. I don't perfectly believe in them. I don't perfectly encourage them. I'm not perfectly always thinking about them, but God... But I do think about my kids a lot. I'm driving in my car. I'm concerned about them. I'll pray for them. They got something coming up. Something had happened in the house that I'm trying to kind of figure out, what was that all about? And where's their little heart? And what, how do I pray for them now? And how do I... If I'm doing that as an earthly father in my imperfection, think about your heavenly father and your fundamental relationship. Think how much he's constantly thinking of you in love, never discouraged, never dissuaded, even if you're blowing it right now. If my kids start blowing it, you know what? It draws me closer to them. I actually move towards them, not away from them. God is not running away from you when you're sinning. He's running. He's, if, if, if this is fathomable, although I don't think there's any spatial distance between us and God, I think he's as close as he's ever be. But just imagine, it's like a concerned parent. It's just like, he's acting out. We got to get in there and get closer. Now I'm really concerned with my boy or my child. Okay. And Jesus says, when you go in prayer, remind yourself of this wonderful, beautiful relationship that you have, that you've been adopted, that he is your spiritual dad. Okay? And don't filter that too much through earthly dads. Some of you have had some terrible dads who've made terrible mistakes. Think of, though, the the dad that you've always wanted. (laughs) And that's your heavenly father, right? He is the dad. If I could ever think what a dad could be and should be to me, a dad who maybe... Maybe, maybe my dad was good, and hopefully you're growing healthy enough not to split people into all bad or all good. They're a combination. But just think of all the good that you wish was more added to a little bit of the good that he, this guy had. That's God the Father. He is your ideal picture, and more, because God really knows how to parent and guide and love and train. Okay? And Jesus says, I want you to start with that when you go to prayer. And I just want you to tell him all that you can about him being your dad. And thank him for it, okay? And what does that mean again? It means closeness, it means trust, it means, you know, he's not passive, he's active, he's love, he's tender, he's, he's a protector, so he's got strength, he's all that. Start with that. Secondly, when you go to God and start with him, then I want you to tell him how great he is. That's basically what Jesus says. Go to God, start with the familial relationship you have with him, and then I want you to tell him how great 
He is. That's how all your prayers should start. Hit pause on you. Just get into his presence. Be glad you're there and then tell him how great he is. Okay? Of course, he's Father, but then he says what? Our Father, hallowed be your name. To hallow someone means to venerate them. Okay? We did this. Kings are venerated. They're given these long, fancy titles. If you look at the history of kings, sorry, I don't have an example here for you. In fact, kings in competing countries would have, you know, now King Henry VIII, ruler of whatever, you know, blah, 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 Britannia, on and on and on the title went. We're venerating him, telling him how great he is. Then, you know, France, the king of France, the blah, 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 the protector of the blah, blah. That's to venerate, right? To venerate is to declare the greatness of. And that's what God says. Hallow his name now. Just tell God how great he is. Get your eyes off you and get him on God. And in your prayer time, start telling them all the things that come to your mind about how great. And again, guys, I'm preaching this because I think it's important for us. I want us all to grow in our, relation, our fundamental relationship with God. I want us to change. Jesus doesn't give us anything that wouldn't be helpful for change. And all of us want to change. Don't we want to change? He gives you this because he says, this will help change you if you'll discipline yourself to train new muscles of prayer that you haven't really used before. Don't default into, I just want to be me. God really actually likes you, but he doesn't like you necessarily right now in that full state. He loves you. He's committed to you. But remember, he's got this amazing, beautiful picture of you that he's working towards. And Jesus would say to all of us today, he'd say, cooperate with God. Discipline. I don't care if you're a Christian who's been 30 years in the Lord, if you've never prayed this way. Hey, good news. Like me, you get to start this way, right? You get to start. So he says, tell him how great he is. Declare to him how great he is. He's creator. He's almighty. He's light of light. He's very God of very God, right? He sees all things. He knows all things. He moves all things. He's bigger than, right? God's bigger than me. God, you're bigger than me. God, you're bigger than my family. You're bigger than my d- dysfunction, my depression. You're bigger than my family. Good, n- good news is, right? bigger than my problems. You're greater than all that. You sit up there. You're wonderful. You're awesome. I don't care what it is. What do we call that, folks, when we start with God and we tell him how great he is? Starts with a W. Yeah, you got it. You're all getting it. It's worship. It's what we do on a Sunday morning, right? It's worship. What God is, we say, look, when you go to prayer, remind yourself of your fundamental relationship. This is not a distant God. It's the essence of Christianity. I am in a relationship, an intimate relationship with the Father. It's not about rules. It's about a relationship. And then I get to come and I get to worship this great God of the universe that while he's imminent, close to me, he's also infinite, untouchable, holy, perfect beauty. I get to be with him one day. He's absolutely committed to me. And I want you to start there. And Jesus would say it because I want, you, I want to change you guys. I want you to change. And it is, again, now I will say this, and then I'm going to share with you a little prayer. Someone's going to ask, and I think we all should ask, well, how long do I stay on that? And as we go through the five weeks, well, how long do I stay on each section? Listen, you're going to find, I don't think Jesus would have a formula. I don't think he'd say, well, you've got to spend three minutes on each section, you know, time your watch, keep coming up with stuff. Listen, you'll get better at it. It just depends where you are, Right? You will find when you discipline yourself to play. The next, you know what we talk about next week? After Jesus says, I want you to start with God, I want you to start reminding him that he's your father, to tell him how great he is. Then I want you to yield your will to his, your will to his will. Then you tell him, hey, I want, you know, I want your kingdom to come, which means I want your agenda over my agenda for today. Okay? Listen, you spend any time on those sections for as long as you need, and you will find that depending on your situation, Certain sections, as you go through your mind, you'll realize, I need to just sit in this section for a while, much longer. I don't need to spend much time in that section, but this section, I need to do. And it could just be, you know what, I'm sick of everything that's going on. I just need to think about God for a while. Or it could be like, so confused, things are becoming clear. I have been pushing my own will and agenda and timetable, and I need to just soak in God's agenda over my agenda, God's will for my life over my life, okay? So, It's going to be up to you. That's the cool thing. There's great freedom within this, but God says this prayer, they can change you. Now, if you're anything like me, it's hard to get started, so I've included it in the bulletin for you. I can find it. Hopefully, it didn't drop out. If you want, if you didn't, you can take some bulletins later, and you can ramsackle through them and find some extra prayers. So, 
I just wrote out, again, this is not a perfunctory prayer, but it's a prayer to help us, right? On the back side of that, I know for myself, and I'll probably put this on my car, in my, on my, um, my speedometer, because I don't like to, ignorance is bliss for me, I'd like to just be ignorant of how fast I'm going. So when in my car I'm praying, it's a discipline to say, oh yeah, and I just wrote here, start with God, acknowledge Him as Father, tell Him how great He is. I've been doing that all week. Now listen, I've just decided because I need training in this, I've decided all week to try and not put in anything for Steve, <laughs> even though that's coming. <laughs> I've just said, I wonder if I can go a week without God bless me, help me, all that. I wonder if I can just stay focused on that. That doesn't matter. That's not your task today. But I would just say on the one side, to help remind you when you're going to God in prayer, to pray as Jesus would teach you to pray, to do that. And then here's the prayer, which is just, again, I just took the model and tried to use the first section we did, and I wrote out a prayer. Take a word from that that may help you kind of spin down a path, and you can think about that. But here's, here's the prayer. Let's just read it together, and I'll, we'll, we'll close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for thinking of me constantly. I am truly sorry that I don't think of you more often. You realize that sometimes in our prayers we can pray, we're not really even thinking about God, are we? We're not really thinking of his essence, right? But I'm thinking of you now, and I want to tell you how much I appreciate that you're my heavenly dad. You're always looking out for me. You always have my best interest in mind, and you're always for me, and you're never against me. So as your child, I thank you with all my heart. Yet, you are not only my father, but my Lord. I want to tell you how great you are because you deserve all my prayers. praise. There is no one like you. You're the creator of the universe. You are bigger than all things, bigger than me, my family, my past, my future, my shame, my doubts, and my circumstances. You know all things and see all things clearly and act with eternal love and infinite wisdom. I honor you for all you do and worship you for all you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay? That can help you a little bit, guide that, take, and, take a look and take that with you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for, again, sending your only begotten Son to earth, God of God, Lord of Lords, who actually taught us how to pray. It's really, it's amazing, Jesus, that you would even want to help us in our prayer life and teach us how to pray so that we could pray, um, we could pray in a way that would change us and maybe even change things more than we realize. Um, so teach us to pray even like little children and help us to, again, Father, to start with you and not with us and help us to fix our eyes first on that fundamental relationship we, we have as your spiritual dad who's wrapped up in our lives and loves us and is helping us and guides us and protects us and nourishes us. And then, Father, help us to find room to tell you back to you, to venerate you, to tell you how awesome you are, how great you are, how bigger you are, to get our minds up and above the stuff that we kind of trod in all the time um, so that our hearts can be more free and our souls more healthy. So we love you. Thank you for all that you do for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.